We start off in the year 1442, when the Turkish Sultan enslaved thousands of Transylvanian boys to fill the ranks of his army. From among these boys grew one fierce warrior known as Vlad the Impaler. After years of war and violence, Vlad came back to Transylvania to rule in peace as a prince. The world, however, would know him as Dracula. And now we have a group of hunters that find a Turkish helm in a local river. Bring it to me. They alert Prince Vlad, who arrives with his guards to inspect the scene. Vlad surmises that the helm must belong to a Turkish scout of Hamza Bey's army. And since it's washed up downstream, that would mean that the Turkish army is in his territory, hiding up at Broken Tooth Mountain. Vlad asks one of his guards, Dimitri, to return to the castle in double security. Meanwhile, Vlad heads out to Broken Tooth with two other guards. They're climbing up the mountain in search, and coming up to the mouth of a cave, a horde of bats fly out. This means that the Turks are hiding inside, because bats don't come out during the daytime. Bats don't come out during the day. Something's to stop them. The three men wander into the pitch black darkness of the cave, lighting torches to guide the way. Skeletons and crushed bones litter the ground, and as they walk deeper into that cave, a creature attacks. Takes out one guard, and then another. Vlad fights it off, stabbing it with his sword as he crawls back to the cave entrance. The creature, a pale-faced humanoid with fangs, can't seem to follow Vlad into the sunlight and retreats to the darkness of the cave. Now back at the castle, Vlad's speaking of his encounter with the unholy creature to a priest. The priest explains the legend behind the creature's existence. You see, the vampire was once a mortal man, but made a bargain with a demon for dark power. The demon tricked him, granting him incredible power, but trapping him in the cave until he's set free by another. Promise me you'll guard this secret, brother. Now that Vlad's back home in the castle, he reunites with his wife Marina and son Ingris. And as they get ready for bed, with Ingris tucked in, Marina asks him, what manner of creature attacked him? But Vlad doesn't tell her about the vampire. The next day is Easter, and the court has come together for a grand feast in the castle, when suddenly, Hamza Bey, a high-ranking commander in that Turkish army, enters. Vlad offers him tribute for the Sultan, but Hamza Bey demands to know what happened to a group of his missing scouts. He switches language to Turkish, so only Vlad understands, and tells of a darkness that he knows is in his heart. Vlad doesn't respond to it, only asking Hamza to take the Sultan's tribute and leave. However, just as he's leaving, he casually mentions that the Sultan once again wants 1,000 boys for his army as child slaves, much to the outrage and horror of the court. Now Vlad, who was a child soldier himself, is shocked, as the Sultan supposedly ended that cruel practice years ago. Hamza only shrugs, stating that child soldiers are more obedient than their adult counterparts. With no army of his own, Vlad is forced to follow the Turkish command, or suffer the consequences. And Hamza tells him as much before leaving. Did you ever give me to the Sultan? So the next day, Vlad and his guards are walking through the Turkish army camp to meet with the Sultan. They used to be best friends back when Vlad was a child soldier. Now Vlad offers himself instead, but the Sultan refuses and demands both the thousand children and Ingris as well. So, when the day arrives to give Ingress over to the Turks, Marina's devastated. She's begging Vlad to do something as a group of Turkish soldiers march towards them to collect the boy. Vlad takes his son by the hand, and they calmly walk to meet the group of soldiers, headed by Hamza Bey. Once they're face to face, Hamza rudely remarks that he thought Vlad would put up more of a fight. And hearing this, Vlad bends down and tells Ingress to run back to his mother. As soon as he's out of the way, Vlad strikes, seizing Hamza Bey's sword and tearing off his arms. He rips into the soldiers with ease, killing them all without breaking a sweat. And as they're dead and dying, Vlad marches back to his son, stating that it isn't a boy's place to save his country. It's not a child's place to save his country. Vlad's guard Dimitri's furious, knowing now that the Sultan will declare war on the whole of Transylvania as retaliation. But Vlad's unrepentant. He gets on his horse and heads for Broken Tooth Mountain where the vampire's lurking. Alone, he makes his way into the cave. This time, the vampire speaks. Those who meant to reek of fear. Surprised that Vlad's returned. He seems to be repelled by the sight of Vlad's silver ring, so he hides it from sight. Now Vlad explains that he's here to free the vampire in return for those powers that'll help save his kingdom. 
Thus, the vampire offers his blood, explaining that it will grant him power, but once he drinks it, his thirst for human blood will be insatiable. If Vlad can resist blood for three days, he'll return to his mortal state. But if he feeds, he'll become a monster forever. The price would be worse than if you'd never stepped in here. Vlad is sure that he can resist and thus, after a little contemplation, lifts the cup to his lips and drinks that blood. He falls unconscious immediately, life flashing before his eyes. And when he wakes up, it's nighttime and he's in the downstream river. He attempts to stand up but is now so strong that, doing so, pulverizes the rocks he was laying on. The cuts on his hand immediately heal, and he can even hear the slightest noise from yards away. He can see miles ahead of him, and even turn into a group of bats on command. However, the silver ring on his hand burns him, so he takes that off and wears it around his neck instead. He flies off into the distance, where the Turkish army's laying siege to his castle, and as Dracula's castle crumbles, Vlad kisses his family and gives a rousing speech to his people. We will not be defeated! Then, he exits the castle to face that army alone. Hundreds of Turks are rushing at him, and he's cutting through the crowd with vampiric powers killing his way through him. Everywhere he goes, soldiers are falling. The seconds bleed into hours and before the night has ended, Vlad single-handedly took down every soldier on the battlefield. His own people, late to the party, rush out at the sudden quiet and find Vlad surrounded by the bodies of fallen foes. He asks them not to speak of the events that occurred that night, instead giving orders for some of his people to leave for Kozia Monastery immediately before the Sultan sends more soldiers. Now the monastery is remote and too high up for the cannon fire to penetrate its walls, so it's their only hope for continued survival. Back at the Turkish camp, Sultan Mehmet receives word that Vlad has taken down a thousand of his men. Unperturbed, Mehmet begins assembling an army of a hundred thousand, with him leading personally to battle Vlad. Before we go on, like the video, smash the subscribe button, turn on that notification bell, or Slenderman will haunt your dreams. So with his new heightened sense of hearing and smell, Vlad is finding it difficult to be out with his companions for dinner, so he heads over to his wife's tent. They start to kiss, but Vlad can hear the thrumming of her blood and gets the insatiable urge to feed on her. So he quickly draws back and rushes out of the tent. I need some help. I'm sorry. Now out in the forest, he senses that someone's following him and forces the man to come out of hiding. Now the crazed man seems to know that Vlad is a vampire and is asking to be bound in servitude to him by offering up his blood, but Vlad rejects the offer. The man disappears into the forest, but the cup of blood remains, taunting him. When Marina wakes up the next morning, she finds Vlad shaking and shivering on the other side of the tent. He confesses that he's become the thing on Broken Tooth, a vampire, showing her how sunlight burns his body and explaining that he has to resist blood for two days more in order to get back to normal. If he were to give in, then he stays a vampire for eternity. But he swears to Marina that he won't give in. I swear it. I will not give in. So Marina gets out of the tent, informing Dimitri that he's in charge with leading the group to the monastery, as Vlad has already gone to spy on the Turks. In reality, though, Vlad can't step outside because of the sun. So by nightfall, the group is close to the monastery but gets ambushed by the Turks. Dimitri leads Ingress and Marino away and is almost killed until Vlad comes to the rescue. And once inside the monastery walls, Vlad makes his men get ready for war. The Sultan marches on to the monastery with an army of thousands, unconcerned about the rumor that is spread about Vlad and his dark magic. Meanwhile, at the monastery, a priest notices that Vlad can't enter the sunlight and is deterred by silver. He pulls a sword on Vlad and begs to kill him before his people do when they realize what he's become. <laughs> well, Vlad refuses and so the priest cuts the canvas of the tent open, letting sunlight pour in and destroying Vlad's face. The people now see that Vlad truly is a monster and they form a mob to kill him, setting the building he's trapped in on fire. Marina struggles to help but is hauled away. When Vlad emerges from the burning building, He's screaming at the mob for their ingratitude. After all, he only became a vampire to save their lives. Do you think you are alive because you can fight? 
in the monastery's church, Vlad's prayed for strength to resist his thirst for one more day. Ingress appears, sharing a loaf of bread with his dad. They hug, and Vlad realizes that he'd become a vampire again and again if it meant saving his son. Now later that night, Marina and Vlad watch from a window as that massive army approaches. Vlad worries about his powers, which will soon disappear at daybreak. Marina mourns how little time they have left and asks him to remember their wedding vows, which state that they would find each other in every lifetime. With the army close, Vlad commandeers thousands of bats to attack. They rain down on the army like arrows, cutting down the first wave of soldiers. Vlad flies into the thick of it all, looking for the Sultan as dawn creeps closer. Now the Turks invade the monastery, taking Ingress away and edging Marina off the edge of a cliff. Marina. Vlad flies after her falling body, but as they're falling, his power wanes with the rising sun, and she hits the ground hard. With her dying breath, Marina urges Vlad to drink her blood, which will allow Vlad to continue being a vampire so he can save their son. Clouds darken the sky as Vlad relents to the thirst, unleashing his fangs and drinking his wife's blood as she dies. So Vlad, now fully a vampire, walks along the smoldering remains of the monastery. Most of his people are dead. Do you want vengeance? But he stumbles upon Dimitri still alive and asks him to drink his blood. Well, Dimitri does, gaining Vlad's strength and becomes a vampire himself. Two women are also still alive and watch as all this is taking place. With that done, Vlad dons his family armor, gives his wife a proper funeral, and prepares to attack the Turkish army once more. Back at the army camp, the Turks wonder why the sun hasn't risen yet. They look to the east and amid a thunderstorm realize that the prince is coming for him. It is the prince. He's coming. He attacks along with that turned guard and two women, who've also become vampires. So Vlad pretty much took all his survivors and made him drink his blood to shift into vampires. And together, they unleash vengeance on the camp. Vlad heads into the largest, most ornate tent to find the Sultan. Inside, Mehmet's waiting, donned entirely in silver. Silver coins are scattered across the floor, and even his sword is pure silver. Ingress is trapped behind him and calls out for his dad. The two are circling each other, swords drawn. Vlad attacks first, but Silver slows him down, dampening his powers and burning his exposed skin. Strung up from the tent are bags full of silver, and Mehmet cuts him down again and again as they're fighting, weakening him until he eventually falls. Ingress screams, trying to free himself with a rope, while Mehmet contemplates how best to kill Vlad. He brings that stake down on his heart, but with the remaining strength he has, he turns into a flock of bats and drives a stake into the Sultan's heart instead. Vlad and Ingress leave the tent hand in hand. Dimitri informs him that all the soldiers are now dead. Suddenly, Dimitri tries to attack Ingress, the last living human. They're all our enemies now. So Vlad drives a spear through his heart, but the other vampires still want him and draw closer to the boy. The priest arrives to the rescue holding out a holy cross so the vampires won't touch him. Vlad gives his son over to the priest and then finally parts the clouds, letting that sunlight beam onto the battlefield. All the vampires, Vlad included, burn to dust in the sudden light. Ingress is crowned king, the Turkish army defeated, and Dracula's name is written out of history. However, just as the scene draws to a close, we see the man who once followed Vlad into the forest drip a cup of blood onto Vlad's corpse. With that, his eyes open as he's revived. Centuries pass, but Vlad's powers are immortal. The setting switches to a bustling modern city, and Vlad's still alive, walking through it, when he encounters a woman who looks exactly like Marina. He recites his old wedding vows, and the woman who introduces herself as Mina tells him that it's her favorite poem, but Vlad's not looking surprised. They walk away together, talking amiably, as Dimitri, who's also somehow